Hi there, I'm Don Green, and today I'm going to be talking about how Kubernetes is changing the games industry. So I'm um, head of platform at a small um, game studio out of London, England called Netspeak Games, and we've just built and launched a mobile MMO in just six months. I'm the head of platform at Netspeak. Now, whilst that sounds impressive, um, it basically means I'm a team of one, the only platform or infra engineer. This is the rest of the studio, We're mainly made up of um, artists, both 2D and 3D, um, a small amount of games engineers, and a commercial team. Um, and as I said, in just six months, we've been able to take an idea from conception all the way through to launch. Today, I'm going to talk about how and why we use Kubernetes along with open source technologies for our underlying infrastructure to launch a game in such a short period of time. So, we're going to talk about why speed matters. Um, especially for free-to-play online games. We're going to look at the infrastructure of games and what the component parts are that make it up. Um, then when we look to use Kubernetes, what were the challenges with this? Um, thankfully, there was a solution, and this was Agonas, an open source project. Um, and also how we can use open source and Kubernetes to empower others within the studio to help them build the game faster. So, how long does it build, take to build a game? This is a game you've probably all heard of, World of Warcraft, released by Blizzard. Um, it's probably got about 13 million subscribers, which pay $9 a month. So it's got good um, revenue. It was also released originally as a boxed game, um, and you paid an initial fee to buy the game. Um, and this actually took around four to five years to build and get out to launch. And even after that, they still constantly updated it with patches and expansions. I think the latest one even took about two years to build in itself. Then we start to look at something like this. This is Brawl Stars by Supercell. And this is a free to play three versus three battle game. Um, it's probably um, a little bit complex, it's got different roles, it's got different ways of playing, and it's got a lot of different content. Um, however, Supercell um, probably took around six months to build this game again. After the launch, they probably tweaked it and made improvements um, after seeing what their players did. How about a free-to-play game that's built on top of Snapchat? Well, this is Bitmoji Party, um, and this is quite a very simple game, and you play, as I said, against other people you know in Snapchat as a filter. This probably took a really small team about three months to play. The infrastructure is all there, it's part of the Snapchat platform, it should be quite easy and quick to build. With this in mind, um, why does, it, why does speed matter? Well, we want this kind of reaction. We want to make sure that it's fun to play for our players, especially in the free-to-play market. So the quicker we get it into our hands, the quicker we find out if the game's fun and if people will continue to play. Um, so what takes up the majority of the time? Well, actually, it's building content. That's why we have so many artists inside the studio. 60% um, of the time is actually built, um, spent building content. Here, you can see Rowan. Um, jumping for joy. He's one of the NPCs within our game. Um, then there's a small amount of time um, for design, production, and kind of operations of the company. Um, and then 25% of the time is actually spent on tech. This includes the gameplay, all the gameplay systems, and things that build the game. Um, included within this 25% is the hosting, the infrastructure, and the platform. This is where I fit in. So, with six months, um, and a game that needed to be built and a new platform, um, what were my ideas? Well, firstly, we don't want to build from scratch. Um, the main idea was that we wanted to invest in any open source technologies that we could, um, standing on top of the shoulders of giants. Um, and also, we wanted to try and make it easy for the game team to use this platform. We didn't want any friction for them when they were building out the game. After this, we let's look at the requirements. We've heard that we've got a single engineer, and six months, they're the two constraints. What do we need to be able to support? Well, thousands of concurrently connected users doing thousands of requests per second, resulting in hundreds of gigabytes of data that needed to be stored about the players and what they were doing. Um, on top of this, we needed to scale with demand. Um, games often are busier during the evenings and weekends and much, much quieter during the day. So we had to have this um, elastic scalability. We wanted to be in multiple locations. The closer our clusters are to our players, the better latency they'll get, which means the game will probably be more enjoyable for them. We needed to make sure that the platform was transparent to the team and the fact that it could evolve over time. We didn't really want to um, lock ourselves into any choices early on. 
Also, we have this idea that if we don't need to build it, if we don't have to. So let's have a quick look behind the scenes, the infrastructure and the various components that make up an online game. First off, the core of it is this idea of a dedicated game server. Um, this is a single process where tens to hundreds of players will connect. It stores the information about the world and constantly updates all those connect connected players about the world around them. It's basically running a simulation. Um, for example, say if my character was running around in the world and dancing, uh, my client would send this up to the dedicated game server, which would then replicate it back to all other connected players. Um, behind the game server is a number of data services um, which connect into data stores. Um, early on, we made sure that we abstracted the data store away from the game server um, and allow the game and play programmers to focus on just calling into APIs rather than underlying storage. This also means that in the future, if we needed to, we could switch out the um, storage for other systems if we want. Okay, so how do you get into an online game? The first step is authentication. You're going to go through a number of steps. Um, when you call the auth service, we verify who you are, um, where you're logged in from, and send you back an authentication token. We actually use JWT for this. From there, you call into a matchmaker, passing that token so that we can identify who you are the matchmaker then will often talk to um, a lot of the data services in the back end to get information about the player, um, what their experience is, which things they're doing at that time, and eventually um, pass back the host IP and port number for the dedicated game server that player is going to connect to. So when we actually connect into a game server, the client actually uses UDP. Um, and it's actually transferring um, data backwards and forwards 30 times a second. So this is quite a lot of data that's going backwards and forwards over the network from the client to the server. The dedicated server not only has to support that single player, in that same process, as we said a minute ago, it supports many players. One interesting thing to note here is that at launch, um, if an online game goes down, it's often not the dedicated game server that is under too much stress. Often, um, we haven't scale tested either the auth system or the matchmaking service. Both of these see a spike in traffic that they're not used to. So, with all this in mind, why Kubernetes? Um, well, going back to the requirements, we needed to support thousands of concurrently connected users, and we had thousands of requests per second. We also needed to scale up and down based on the demand that we were seeing. We've seen that Kubernetes can easily deal with this, um, and even start to scale up to thousands of nodes. Um, especially in lines of business applications. So hopefully we could take this and apply it to a game. Kubernetes also runs anywhere. We can deploy it into, into any cloud provider, or we can even use bare metal. With this, it also allows us to standardize the technologies that we're using, both for the dedicated game server and those supporting services in the background. If all of these are running in Kubernetes, we have a standard way of doing the majority of things. Along with this, Kubernetes has a huge community of thousands of engineers that if we run into any problems would more than likely be happy to help out. So was it just that easy? Did we just take our game server, put it into a container and run it in Kubernetes, job done, um, Dom takes a holiday for the, the remaining three months? Unfortunately not. The first problem we came into was containerizing Unreal. Um, Unreal was actually first built in 95 um, as an engine for a first person shooter. Um, the version we're using Unreal 4 was actually rebuilt in 2005. Um, however, with this being so old, it's not like it's a cloud native application. Um, logs are in a human readable format and there's no concept of things like metrics or distributed tracing. There's no documentation of even how best to run this inside a container. Thankfully, it can be cross compiled from Windows into Linux um, and so we actually were able to get it into a container. However, Try running it as root or even the user Unreal and you're in for some serious. So from here, we tried to run our game servers deployment. This is the first thing we looked at. Um, deployments allow us to scale up and down easy. Um, the other thing we needed to do was because we were doing UDP, we actually wanted to connect straight into the host machine and port map the host machine's port into the container's port. Um, this seems easy enough, so we could do that. We just avoided using services. Um, so we can scale up and have multiple game servers on different nodes. Um, so that's fine, we've got many different game servers, um, each mapped to port 7777 on the host machine. 
However, the promise of Kubernetes was more that we can run many, many containers on the same node. However, this starts to become a problem. If two containers on the same node are trying to map to the same host port, we end up having co collision. So it's not just that easy to run multiple containers mapping to the same host port. We need to think of another way of doing it, or some kind of clever infrastructure between to make sure the ports mapped to different ports that are exposed to the internet. Next, what about scaling um, scaling the pods? Like scaling up is quite easy, you just add more pods. This isn't going to affect anyone that's connected into a dedicated game server. However, when you come to scale down, how do we guarantee that we're not scaling down a, um, a pod that's got players connected? This is definitely one of the bigger issues. It also um, is an issue if we wanted to upgrade our game server. If we deployed a new image version, this would also result in all the containers being restarted into that new version. Thankfully, open source came to our rescue. Um, there's a project out there called Agonas. Um, you can go to agonas.dev to find out more about it, and it allows us to host, run, and scale dedicated servers on top of Kubernetes. This project was actually built by Ubisoft and Google to help Ubisoft actually scale their own game servers on top of Kubernetes. So what does um, Agonas give us? Well, it gives us a number of um, custom resource definitions which uh, make game serves a first class citizen of Kubernetes and access via kubectl. Um, here you can see the YAML. I know everyone loves YAML, so it wouldn't be a um, Kubernetes presentation without a bit. Um, and here all we've done is specify the image we want our game server to be, and this will pull it down from the container registry. Um, and at the top, we've actually said that we want to map the container port. Um, here we have two, we have the default and the beacon. Um, so 7777 is dynamically mapped to the host machine. Um, and this, we'll see in a minute, allows us to turn that port on the host machine from the, the port that we have in the container to an arbitrary port that is then exposed to the internet. Along with this, um, Agonas gives us a sidecar, which allows the, um, allow the dedicated server to actually talk to Kubernetes and tell it about various things that's happening within the game. So you could communicate out from your game um, via the Agonas sidecar with some kind of SDK. When we started using Agonas, we realized that the SDK wasn't quite where it needed to be. So we um, internally had built, rebuilt our own version. And what we quickly decided to do was give this back to the community. Um, we're very strong believers in open source and not just about using open source technologies, but contributing back so that collectively everyone can improve together. What else does um, Agonas gives us? Um, it gives us the concept of fleets. Again, this is another custom resource definition, which is basically a collection of game servers. Um, it helps with allocation of users to the dedicated game server, and we'll see that in a moment. Um, also, it's got different ways of being able to scale. We can scale um, the game servers over a number of nodes, either using um, a packed distribution method, whereby um, all the game servers are launch on a single node first, or a distributed method that you can see at the bottom here, whereby you scale out to different nodes in a round, almost round robin fashion. Along with fleets, there is a fleet autoscaler. This allows us to say that we want a maximum of 10 game servers in this fleet, and we always want to have, say, two, um, two game servers that are warm, ready to accept players. And each time the game servers move through different stages, um, this would allow us to spin up more and keep more warm for the players coming in afterwards. So fleets are a collection of game servers and this will help us scale up. As we've seen, we can distribute over different ways over nodes. However, it will also help us when scaling down and making sure our players aren't disconnected from their dedicated game servers. To see this, we have to actually dig into a little bit more of the life cycle of what happens to our dedicated game servers. So here we are, we start up and as the pod's created, the sidecar actually allocates the port from the host machine. And so now we are, instead of having the port 7777, we have mapped it to 7112. Um, at this point, the container is running, um, it goes into a scheduled state. From here, it's over to the game server itself. The game server at this point is responsible for putting, um, telling the game is when it is ready to start accepting players. And the reason why this is, is you could actually be loading the number of assets in the back, hydrating some kind of state from a database, or waiting for some long computation to happen before you want to accept players. Um, so when it finally says it's in the ready state, this is when we can now start 
um, directing players to it. As we said earlier, players come in through a matchmaker. So the first thing the client will do is auth, go into the matchmaker and say, I want to find a server to connect to. At this point, our matchmaker actually calls into a number of backend services, gets information about the player, and then asks um, the Agona's APIs internally to allocate it a game server. Um, what this does is um, Agona's will actually talk to the fleet and say, tell me which, um, tell me which game server to allocate. This will then put the game server into an allocated state and return the IP address of the host and the port number where the player should connect to. Whilst it's in the allocated state, this is kind of one of the most important parts for scaling down, and we'll see why in a minute. But this effectively is saying that either a player is about to connect or has connected. So here we can see um, the client connects with UDP into the, that host machine, host port, into the container. Um, now the, the container is allocated, and we can see that we have a happy user playing the game. Finally, the, um, after the player is disconnected and the game server is no longer needed anymore, we need to scale it down. Um, and this is done by the game server itself saying, I've got no more players left, I've cleaned up, saved all the data that I needed to, I can actually shut down. In doing so, it calls out via the SDK again, um, signaling to a gonus to clear it up and the the pod will be replaced by another one, which will go into a ready state to accept more players. So from here, let's have a look what happens. If we scale up the fleet and set the number of replicas to six, you can see that there are a number of different um, pods running there. These are actually game servers. Um, and so which port they're mapped to on the host machine and how long they've been running. So great, we've scaled up. And um, what about if we try and scale down all the way to zero? Well, this happens. This is the fact that we've actually said via cube cuddle, um, scale the fleet up to six replicas, um, down to zero replicas. Um, however, it's taken all of them down apart from the game server that was allocated. This is very important and this is why Agonis helps with scaling up and down game servers. It knows that players are connected to this server so it won't destroy it or move it from the machine that it's on. Doing so would obviously end the session for the player and result in an unhappy experience. So we don't only have to run a single fleet within our cluster. Um, and what we actually do is allow devs to run a separate fleet. All our devs inside NetSpeak um, can have a fleet of their own, and at any point in time, they can actually deploy into this fleet. So they can run against the same infrastructure as our players are, um, whilst they're talking to the same data services, effectively testing a new version of the game in production alongside other running customers. Um, what, so what does, what does Agonis give us? Well, we've seen that it's the ability to map container ports to host ports. This is in a dynamic way. It's protected us um, from players whilst we're scaling down or upgrading the version of the game server. It's given us multiple fleets so that our developers can run in the same infrastructure um, as our consumers. Um, and it gives us the ability to auto scale up and down and keep a number of warm servers for us. Um, from here, we have an SDK which we can talk to the platform to signal various states. So finally, what I want to talk about is how this platform and the Gonas, along with some other open source technologies, empower our team. Um, what we want to make sure that building this platform, we um, we made it easy for team, the team to run on top of the infrastructure. We have gameplay programmers and artists who aren't familiar with infrastructure and especially not familiar with Kubernetes. So we wanted to make the experience as transparent as possible for them so they could keep up this quick cadence of building. The first step in this journey is making sure that they could automatically um, build out a client and a server whenever they wanted. Uh, so we're actually using GitHub Actions to this, and they can signify which fleet they want to um, have the client connect to, they can signal what branch it comes from, and they can do the same with the server. Um, once they do this for the client, it's actually uploaded, and they get a notification on their device, and they can automatically then download that client and connect into a game server. However, we still haven't deployed the game server into Kubernetes. Um, deploying into Kubernetes was one of the areas which I um, was basically a real head scratcher for a while. And then I thought about what some of the technologies are out there. GitOps it was the answer for us, effectively allowing um, us to take advantage of Git, but more specifically take advantage of the fact that um, GitHub and GitLab have a user-friendly UI. So the artist can easily go into the UI, change the version number, and not have to worry about what happens with the infrastructure in the background. In doing so, they create a pull request, which is accepted by one of the other team members. And within minutes, 
they've got a new version of the server running inside a fleet on the same production hardware where customers are. This allows them to really speed up and iterate fast on building out the game. So we've got GitOps for deployment, we've got an automated build system that um, pushes out clients. We also have a supporting cast of other things which help the game engineers and artists ensure that the game is being built in the correct way. We use things like C Advisor to ensure that we have the correct metrics and CPU, memory utilization, which goes into Prometheus and eventually displayed to them in Grafana. Again, this is just another website that they go to. We've hidden all the magic away um, so they don't have to concern themselves with this. Um, similarly, with logs, I mentioned earlier that um, Unreal has human readable logs. We use a tool called Vector to pass these logs out and ship them into Elasticsearch for it to eventually be displayed to the user. Um, this means that the, the team don't have to worry about tailing logs in Kubernetes or worrying about how to use different command line tools. Um, keeping it in a web interface means it's really easy and simple for people to use. So, what have we been able to, uh, to develop within six months? Um, Kubernetes has given us the ability to build out something that can be deployed anywhere, as I said, in any location, any cloud provider, or even on bare metal. Um, with, the, with the addition of Agonas, we can now scale up and down without affecting our players that are connected to the game. Um, this has also given us the ability to support thousands of connected users on multiple instances of Unreal. This allows us to do it in such a way that's low friction for the game team, and it, they then have a self-service way of deploying and monitoring their game. Hopefully, this actually speeds them up and doesn't get in the way of what they're trying to achieve. So, what have we learned? Kubernetes gives us some kind of standardization. Especially with containers, we, we run and build our dedicated game server out in the same way we do our matchmaker and all our data services. So it's one standard approach to doing infrastructure. We've utilized open source to make sure that we can move fast. We didn't have to build, we didn't build anything that we didn't have to. Also, the open source community adds to our team. They really allowed us to move fast and can help us whenever problems occur, rather than using something that's homegrown and custom. Um, also, empowering our pe the people using the platform inside the studio is really important. If it gets in, if it Kubernetes gets in the way of us building the game, we won't be able to release it in the time frame we need. So, what have we looked at today? We've talked through why speed matters in the games industry. It's about getting into the hands of the users and finding what the fun experience is. We've looked at the infrastructure of games and some of the key parts. This is the authentication service, the matchmaker, and specifically the dedicated game servers. We've hit some issues um, when running them inside Kubernetes especially with just vanilla deployments. However, we have utilized open source, um, especially with the GONAS that has helped us overcome these obstacles, map the host ports to the container ports and scale up and down with ease. And then finally, we looked at how using open source and specifically GitOps can really empower the people on the team. Thank you very much for listening today. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.